Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Daniel. I will soon be joined by Ben Brown. But welcome to this week's edition of Late Night Reds, brought to you by the Riverfront, part of the Blue Wire Media Podcast Network. Very excited for another fun show this week. And of course, this would not be possible without any of you lovely, lovely people at patreon.com slash riverfrontcincy, where just for a couple bucks a month, you can come hang out with us each and every day uh, and talk a little baseball with us. What's up, Josh? How are you? Fellas, soon to be fellas. Like I said, Ben's running behind. But why don't you kind of get started, obviously? Can't miss that nine on the dot, right? You know? Can't have that happening. But a lot of fun things to talk about this week. I know this was not uh, ideal to lose two out of three this weekend. But I thought they played pretty well. Um, curious what you guys thought about that as well. I know uh, hoping for Ben to get on in time for us to talk about that. But we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll just go and get started. We'll go through the series. And kind of talk, talk, talk about a couple things. So, yeah, went toe to toe with the defending World Series champion Texas Rangers in Arlington. Uh, Friday, you lose two to one. Uh, I thought Graham Ashcraft played pitch really well, honestly. Got into the seventh, uh, no walks, you know, had one earned run. I thought Lucas Sims, you know, minus that one pitch, honestly, was fine. Um, obviously, that's what cost him the game, which was disappointing, but I didn't think he was really all that bad. Um, Saturday, Hold it just a second. Benny. What up, man? Hey, pal. Bro, I tell you what. This, this, my computer was acting so slow. Yeah? Insane. Well, you're here. We just got started, so you didn't miss anything. So, what's going to talk a little bit wow. about the Ranger series? It was a good series, okay. honestly. Yeah. Uh, so we just talked about Friday, yeah, where was. Graham Ashcraft was pretty good. Uh, Saturday, which we're going to dive deeper into this, uh, obviously. Hunter Green, seven innings, one hit, one walk, six strikeouts. Fantastic. Jonathan India, four hits on top of the two hits he had to start the weekend. Uh, and then Will Benson obviously goes two for five with a home run Saturday. And today... Look, just couldn't get over the hump. They uh, Andrew Abbott has a four spot to start the game, but pitches really well the rest of his start. The bullpen, the three most unlikely guys, maybe you would think, in the bullpen holding him down this uh, through this one between Lucas Sims and Emilio Pagan. Um, and I don't have – I had this – of course, it slips my mind. Um, but, of course, and then uh, Jonathan India once again today, two for four. So, Ben, I'm going to bring this back to the full screen here. Uh, when we talk, when we look into this and I know it's t- loss of two out of three, but I feel kind of better about this team than I did in the past because I've always felt good about them. I think that, you know, I, I do think they'll win the central. And if you look at MLB.com and uh, they, if you go by expected win loss, the Reds should be in first place right now in the central and also have the best run differential of anyone in the division without the XYZ guys we've mentioned, but um, you yeah. go, you split the series with the Phillies, you win the season series against the Phillies, and then you just have a, a couple of games against the Rangers, who I know haven't found their strike quite yet, but are still pretty loaded with talent. Um, and the starting pitching was really solid overall. I mean, one really bad inning between the three guys and the yeah. rest of it, they were really good. I feel pretty decent about this team after this weekend even more than i did already oh yeah absolutely i don't i mean there are a couple guys that i'm concerned about um but overall um it was really um like you said one inning each game and even not in the two losses that was kind of crazy i mean you know today was the first inning gives up two home runs um you know you know, uh, Suter comes in and it gives up four runs the other night, you know. But other than that, dude, I, I feel pretty confident about um, what we've done o- over the weekend. Like, I, I, I feel pretty good. People tend to forget, man, that's the, that's the defending champs, you know what I mean? So, like, even though they're not rolling, they still have the pedigree of winning. So, for you to go on the road and to compete like that, uh, yeah, I, I still feel pretty good. Um, like I said, there are a couple guys I'm concerned about. Um, oh, we're going to dive into that. 
And we're, we'll definitely, I know we're definitely going to talk about that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel good overall. Um, it, I know it's hard not to win a series and still feel good, but I still feel pretty good about where we're at. So, all right. So Josh brings up, this is the kind of the point that I, I'm, why I'm feeling the way I feel right now. Um, being down Pat McClain, Matt McClain, Noel V. Marte, and Teacher Friedel, we are looking pretty good. And then the sickness that went to the clubhouse, we were looking all right. Um, that's exactly where I'm at. Like they're in these games, the run differentials where you want it to be, mm-hmm. and their offense hasn't found the stride yet. Uh, that's why I feel pretty good about this. Um, you mentioned like, yeah, that's defending champs. That's a tough place to win. Um, even though that, even though, and it's yeah. Bruce Bochy who stands on business. Like, uh, yes, so if you're does. playing, yeah. So you know, that's the same thing as well. Um, it was nice to see old friend Mikey Biceps. I'm glad we got the better of him. Um, obviously, but happy to see him yeah. doing well there. And um, we talked about this forever. And we're like I said, we're gonna get into some individual performances here in a second. Uh, the division wasn't very good this weekend either. Um, I know no. the Cardinals got one game against the Mets, but uh, the Red Sox are smoking the Cubs. They're up four one right now. Uh, yesterday yeah. they put put some put the work on them as well. Seventeen to nothing. Uh, two touchdowns yeah. and a field goal. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, and then the, of course the the Yankees put up fifteen a fifteen spot on the Brew Crew yesterday. Yeah. So um, I yeah I feel all right, man. Um, I would I do want to dive into a few other things. Oh hey, bro. Steve hey. Pops hey. That. So I see Steven. Steven pops up on the feed today. He's the, he's in Arlington. He's at the game. Did you know they serve Whataburger in the ballpark there? No way. Dude, he's got a picture. He's like ready for the Reds game. He's got a Whataburger in his hand. I'm like, <laughs> what? Like that alone could get me in your stadium. All right. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's legit. Yeah. My hot take. Maybe we're going to lose some listeners tonight. Whataburger is better than in and out. I stand on business. <laughs> He stands on it. <laughs> Steve, I will DM you real quick. I will D de- I'll text you the link. Looks like we're gonna have a surprise appearance by Steve Offenbaker tonight. People, you had no idea. There it is, baby. No idea. My dog was coming to hang with us tonight. All right. I just texted to you. We've never done that on air. So, um, that was pretty sweet. Oh yeah, dude, we got to talk about this. Bob brings up a great news. This just broke like an hour before we went live. Yep. MLB going back to the old old uniform template. Like, Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes internet bullying, it's never a good thing. But sometimes it's beneficial, right? Like, hey, listen. Internet bullying got us WrestleMania 40. You know what I mean? What yeah. we wanted. You yeah, know what that's I mean? true. <laughs> so, that's true. Internet bullying, internet bullying sometimes is not good, but sometimes, you know what? America, America listens. MLB listens. <laughs> Scott Whataburger is better. My guy. Here he is, guys. What up, buddy? What is happening? What's up? Are you in your hotel room in Arlington right now? Yeah, I am. I'm still, I fly out in the morning. I fly home in the morning. Yeah. Awesome. Well, okay. joining us on a surprise appearance, Stephen Offenbaker of Locked on Reds. If you have, if you know Reds podcast. Um, you obviously know who this guy is. And uh, I want to share real quick before we get into the series, because you were down there. Um, we hung out opening day weekend, a couple nights. We went, uh, we caught a couple of those games together. And I made a joke to you that I laughed, that we laughed at literally for hours. And so when you hang out with Steve and Jeff and those guys, when you're at games, you know, everyone comes up to me. It's awesome. It's really cool to see them get recognition for the hard work they put in where everyone's like, I love your show. I listen to your show every day. And you certainly respect it and you like it. So I made the joke that I was uh, Paul Rudd in Avengers Endgame when I'm standing next to him and all these people going up to him like, you guys want a picture with me? I'm (laughs) Ant-Man. And I think like five people got the joke, but I really enjoyed it. (laughs) You're better than Ant-Man. Come on. All right. Give us a sit here before we get into the series. Whataburger in the ballpark. All right. So that's legit. Um, uh, yeah, I posted that picture of it, and uh, it was uh, it was perfect. A uh, little, <laughs> little bit more expensive than going to the good old Whataburger on the corner uh, over here or whatever. But uh, right there at the ballpark, giant-sized burger, 
They've got the milkshakes. They've got the Dr. Pepper and the authentic original Whataburger styrofoam cup. Yeah, you can't go wrong. man. Oof. I, uh, I'm craving Whataburger now. So we got to, we got, Steve, come back from a, a Hawaiian franchise, one of those in Cincinnati. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Get that locked on money. Oh, man. If yeah. only. If <laughs> only. All right, dude. So I've started the show by saying I come out of this series feeling okay about the team, even though it didn't go their way two of those nights. Um, mm-hmm. Really, the starters had one inning that wasn't very good. It was the first inning today. Mm-hmm. Um, the bullpen really was solid throughout the week and minus Brent Suter's ninth inning yesterday, but they were up 8 nothing. so I'm not mad at him for that, especially how good he's been. Um, obviously, Ellie doing Ellie things is always going to be popular, but Jonathan India's bat came up, which we're going to talk about that here in a second. And all the guys that are missing that we've talked, that every podcast has talked about, you know, they went toe to toe with the World Series champions and really could have made the case they could have won all three games. I feel all right, man. Where 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 are you at on the vibe check? Right yeah, now? yeah. Jeff disagreed with me. I I felt like when you look at the schedule between now and when the St. Louis Cardinals arrive on Memorial Day, which by the way, I don't know if you caught that show where we were talking about the schedule, but the St. Louis Cardinals come to town on Memorial Day. And the red saw fit, and it's perfect. The red saw fit to make that senior day down at old Great American Ballpark. So, so you'll be there. So, we, oh my God. Ah! Well, gotta go. This has been my appearance on the show. <laughs> oh. But you know, the, the, the average age of a player for the St. Louis Cardinals, I think, is the same as me, like 46 years mm-hmm. old. So the fact that it's senior day when they come to town is great. But Jeff disagreed with me in that I felt like of the schedule from now through then, this was the most winnable series. This was the series where they had the best chance to either eke out a a series win or even maybe steal a sweep just because they weren't facing the Rangers' best pitchers. The Rangers have been kind of streaky. I thought they were catching them at the right time. And I think you're right. Absent uh, Abbott's one for his first inning yesterday or today rather where – he clearly just didn't have a command of his pitches in the first inning. And he found it after the first inning. Um, absent that it was a great start. Um, and you go to Ashcraft start on Friday. That's another case where if, if that's turned just a little different, in a two, one ball game, uh, they win that game as well. So I'm still not ready to panic. Um, I have some concerns. Jeff and I are going to talk about on tomorrow's show. Um, I'm worried about Jamer Candelario. He is not, I am, um, I'm, <laughs> worried a little bit starting to worry about Emilio Pagan not being quite as advertised and I couldn't I can't really point to something specific in his numbers it's an eye test thing it's a gut thing to how I feel when he comes into a ball game right now and he is not inspiring you know me being like sure. all right we got this we're getting these outs like I'm I'm a little I'm a little bound up when he comes in so uh, but by and large I, I think that given where they're at, given who they're missing, given everything that's happened between two weeks before opening day and now, the fact that they're still above 500, the fact that they're still in the hunt, the fact that the wheels have not fallen off, all say to me that when we start getting people back, this team is going to be really good really fast. Uh, TJ Friedel will start to turn that tide as soon as we can get him back up here. And then not long after that, Noel V. Marte will be eligible to return from his suspension. And then we're cooking with gasoline uh, and hopefully are in a position to bring back a uh, bionic surgically repaired Matt McClain end of August, beginning of September to make a playoff push. So I'm still willing to talk about this team being a playoff team, making a playoff push. It's just not exactly how we envisioned it when we talked about this leading into the season. Yeah. Good friend of the na- of the network, obviously Seth Shaner. Check him out at Red Lake Roundtable. And this Matt McLean, yet I still like this team. Um, perfect, exactly how I feel. Um, let's go real quick, Ben. We'll get you back in the combo here. Oh, you're um, good. Jonathan India this weekend. So, Steve, if I am going to bring up segments from your show this week, I apologize. I don't mean to make you bury your lead. It's just uh, like we said, you were a surprise appearance, which I always appreciate when you're on. Um, this weekend in Texas. 8 of 12, a homer, 4 RBIs, 4 hits yesterday, 2 on Friday, 2 today. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and like say like he's back and he's we're going to see what we expect from him, but 
this was a good feeling, right? Um, we know that he wasn't hitting the ball very well for you know the start of the year, but he was drawing, he was drawing walks, right? And he was still able to do that. And here, uh, I know he didn't play second base this week, he just played, he was DHing, but I feel like when you come out of what we saw from him this week with um, you know, eight hits and 12 at bats, and the way he was dialed in in the box. I, I feel pretty good about him. Ben, where are you on the, on, on the, the weekend of Jonathan India? Um, it was a great bounce back weekend. And I know that he was coming off that little flu bug um, and having some issues with his health and, and, and things like that. But dude, that's a really good, solid bounce back weekend for him. Uh, Cause even before last week, I know that we had talked about his struggles at the plate and, you know, him being at lead off, getting him moved down the lineup a little bit. Um, may have helped him get a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and, I, and not that he was a bad leadoff guy. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But, you know, when you move a guy down in the lineup, it gives him an opportunity to see more pitches from other at-bats. So you're getting more feedback than you are as the leadoff guy. So I think some of that may have helped him. Um, I think days off sometimes help um, because it just resets your system, right? So um, a lot of that for him was just a reset. Um, and, and a lot of it, too, I think, I think a lot of it is that he may be might have been pushing a little bit as being that leader and that leadoff guy. So um, yeah, I, I think that seeing that him come back after those days off, come in, hit baseballs well, have good at bats. Um, it's it, I think that's that's definitely a good sign. Yeah, uh, Jonathan India is seeing beach balls while everybody else is seeing baseballs right now, and that's mm-hmm. a great place to be. This lineup has been desperate desperate for somebody to be the engine that drives the thing uh that was supposed to be matt mcclain that's who it was supposed to be that was what his role was going to be uh and then they lose friedel who you would think would be your option b there to be kind of the guy that's going to be your your plate setter your 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 driver of this machine and they lost both of those guys so this lineup's been desperate for somebody to step up does that mean jonathan india's back not quite ready to say that for sure but i think that uh, he's due to go on a heater, man. He is. He needs a good solid two weeks of what we saw this weekend in Arlington. And so much fun to see live, by the way, in that ballpark. Um, you know, for the most part, had a great time down here watching the old red legs. I uh, got to see some some really good performances. Uh, but Jonathan India, you know, he still keeps he keeps showing us flashes of, of, of getting to be that guy. And, you know, my how he's come from – Man without a home, man without a position, <laughs> man, are we even going to keep you here to yep. pretty much being just invaluable yeah. <laughs> to, to what's going on right now? Yeah, you aren't lying there for sure. Yeah, man, this is what you wanted. And um, you mentioned obviously going to San Diego here this week to start the start the weekend series. Um, he's played pretty well there in the past. He's, he's, had, he's had success in, the, in Petco, so hopefully he can keep that going. And uh, we can get that going, especially coming back with the, coming back home for that Baltimore series. Uh, right. You guys want to talk about Hunter Green, or you wish we get to the fan mail questions? We got three from the Patreon this week. I want to look at. Oh, uh, let's let's discuss a little Hunter Green. All right, and Steve, I'm so happy you were here for this <laughs> because you and I had a very lengthy Hunter Green conversation when you were in town. Mm-hmm. And you and I are both guys who we've texted about it. We've we're kind of in the same boat of we really love them. We're not giving up on them, but we want to see improvement. And mm-hmm. whew, what was that this week? How about that? So both starts this week. He goes into the seventh inning, and I know the Phillies start. People have mixed or mixed reviews on. I understand that. I'm not going to fight you to say you're right or wrong. Um, and then last night, obvi- yesterday, obviously, just tremendous seven innings, one hit, one walk. But this week, 14 innings pitch between two starts, just four earned runs. That's a two point. That's right under 2.6 ERA. You love to see that. 12 strikeouts to three walks for Hunter Green. That's nice to see. Mm-hmm. Only eight hits, and most importantly, no homers. Guys, this is what we want to see, right? This is the dude that we keep thinking we're going to get. And I think that, and I understand, look, four runs, people are not, are not going to be pleased with that four runs in seven innings. I understand. But against that team that he did that against the Philadelphia on Monday, where realistically he, he left them with a chance to win and the bullpen 
just didn't have a great Monday night. And today and yesterday, just as soon as he took the mound, he looked locked in. First inning, I think he had like 11 pitches, and it was like, oh, this hunter's here. You saw him falling back in love with his fastball and locating it more than anything was important. So um, dude's like, I feel super happy. I know he's going to have a really tough uh, tough start. is not start his next start coming up this weekend against the Orioles. But that was a really comforting week from him after the ups and downs we've seen so far this season. Yeah, somewhere along the way, I've got labeled this anti-Hunter Green guy. And I didn't say I that. Like, no, 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 not from you. I, my own comment section has been lighting me up. In fact, I got several <laughs> several comments after that start. Like, oh, I bet Steve's sad to see that this Hunter Green. I'm like, no, I'm not sad. This is the Hunter Green that I've been waiting <laughs> yeah, why to would show you be up sad? all along. Why would I be sad? Right. No, uh, somewhere along the way, people felt like that, well, you know, you don't like Hunter Green. No, I didn't like Hunter Green being bad. I wanted good Hunter Green. I wanted Hunter Green to be this guy. Um, I wasn't ready to call him an ace anymore. I wasn't ready to say I would rely on him and gave one of a playoff series because you never know what was going to happen. You never know who was going to show up, and mm-hmm. he was only going to give you four innings. Uh, as he continues to get command of his fastball, as he pitches to contact versus trying to just blow everybody's doors off, he gets mm-hmm. better. And for me – if he can be this guy, if he can give them six or seven innings every time that he goes out, somewhere between zero and three earned runs-ish, mm-hmm. that's a guy you can rely on. That's a guy that I'm confident to say, yes, start him in game one. Run him out there. I'm happy he's on the mound today. Um, so now it's a matter of him taking what we've seen the last couple starts and showing us that that's who he is and that he can yep. be consistent. Um, yep. I don't want to see four inning Hunter Green show up in that start versus the Orioles because he's amped up and they're at home or whatever. I, I need him to be the guy that he is every time he comes out. Um, some of that's youth. Some of that is, I think, I think his confidence was busted a, a little bit um, as he got smacked around. Um, you know, he, he lacked some of that swagger that mm-hmm. really made him who he was in the beginning. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, I, I think that I think he's showing us more and more and more of the picture that he can be. I, I just need him to dial it in now and be consistent with it. And no, I am not happy that he has bad performances and I'm not sad that when he's good, I, I want him to be the ace of the staff. Yeah, no, no, I, you're spot on Steve. Like the biggest thing for me that I notice is that it's not, it's not 10 or 11, 12 strikeouts a game. It's throwing the ball consistently, uh, putting his fastball where he wants it. Pitching to contact has been huge for him. You Not everybody is going to strike out at a fastball. You have to learn how to pitch to contact, put your fastball in spots where you want it, and your off stuff has to be good. And that's what I've kind of seen in these last couple of starts. His off stuff has been a little bit better. His fastball has been better located. And he's not trying to blow the ball by everybody. He's just pitching the contact and saying, hey, guys, we got to play some defense behind that. And he does. He's got a very good defense behind him. So that's been the cool thing to see with these last couple of starts is his ability to be able to locate that fastball and not be the guy saying, yeah, try to hit it. And, and, and you know, in turn, also, I think he's – starting to mature a little bit when you brought that up his maturity i think he's starting to mature a little bit and understand that you know what i'm on i I am a strong pitcher but i have to also think about where i locate things and i have to be able to rely on other stuff so um those have been the cool things to be able to see him do also too, dude getting the seven innings is so clutch i mean that's that's the key to everything Mm -hmm. if he can get you to seven innings Two, like you said, zero to three runs, seven innings, uh, you know, minimal walks, you know, six to eight strikeouts. Dude, that's where you want him to be. Mm-hmm. That's where you want him yep. to be. So to see that from those last couple starts, to see him where he is now, um, I'm hoping that is who he is for the next 20 starts. Like, uh, that's the Hunter Green that we need to see. So I'm going to reference my favorite website in the universe here real quick, Baseball Savant. I know I reference it every week, but I love it. So here's where Hunter Green is right now in percentile rankings. Fastball run value, 98 percentile. Expected ERA, 88 percentile. Expected opponent batting average, 93 percentile. 
Festival Velocity is still in the 97th percentile, and he's still getting people out. This is what we want. Scott, right here. Point of the show so far, if StreamYard will cooperate with me. Strikeouts provide a wealth factor, but they're overrated. And that was an out. Your team needs 27 of every game, especially given the state of starting pitching these days. Spot on. That's spot on. That's exactly what we're talking about. Like, Steve, you were there, so you could see it. Like, we got the TV angle, obviously. We mm-hmm. unfortunately had to listen to AJ Pierzynski call the game. You were lucky that you didn't have to go through that. Um, <laughs> but he was dotting his slider yesterday. Mm-hmm. Dotting it. It was, and dude, it was awesome. Like, low and away, he got Corey Seager on one that it was like, that was beautiful. And you know, you know what's interesting is he only threw that pitch like 27 times, 27%. He threw his fastball in the 70s, 70%, uh, 73, 74% fastballs. Uh, and then he dropped in the slider another 20 something percent. And he threw one splitter. One's all you need, buddy. One is all you need. Wow. Yeah. So. I think we can all agree. We're very excited about that here and where we're going here. So a couple segments. I forgot to put in the slides. Ben. Yeah. I forgot this week's Ellie is awesome slide, but I got it. Oh man. Uh, It's all right. So (laughs) after today, and mind you, as I say this stat, we still have two more games left in the month of April. Ellie de la Cruz now has the fourth most stolen bases of any player before the end of April in Major League history. Behind Ricky Henderson at 22, Ricky mm-hmm. Henderson at 20, and Deion Sanders at 19. Oh, by the way, they still have two games left. So, yeah. And I wanted to point out, too, um, not to keep referencing the fact that Steve is in the ballpark and he can attest to what we're saying, but yesterday obviously wasn't his best day at the part, like the plate. No one's going to remember that day at the plate. But even though he wasn't getting hits – even though he wasn't like things were going his way, he didn't give up on anything and he made some great plays defensively. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited about that. Did you guys carry Bonted today? I actually kind of like the decision to go for oh, it. Oh, I, I have real problems with that. Do if you? you wanna, if you want to. Sure. Look, look I, I like that they added uh, that this is going to be a weapon that he has in his arsenal. This is going to be something that he can go to. But when you're in the eighth inning and you're capable of changing the outcome of the game with one swing, you do not bunt. You do not bunt to try and get on base and pass the buck to somebody else to try and win the game for you. Ellie De La Cruz is one of the superstars of this team, and he should have been swinging for the fences in that at bat. Like, if that was the third inning, I wouldn't care. But because it was so late in the game and that was going to be his last opportunity to bat, he should have been trying to win that game for the Reds. I can respect that. Yeah, I can respect that. I could, I could see that. My my I guess my only I guess my only thing is is that Ellie getting on base can change the game. Like I like mm-hmm. like I definitely see where he, like he definitely home run get on base, but I guess I can see where he's trying to get on. I mean he's still second, still third. Somebody knocks him in. Like you said, there there's there's multiple things to it, but like you said, eighth inning, I can see like yeah, he needs to be swinging for the fences, <laughs> especially with I mean, his power. Not- I mean, you're not wrong. He can do a lot of things with his legs. I just feel like the 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 way that that he could have best helped the team in that situation is to put that ball in play. Go in play. go hit yeah. a triple. Go force the outfielder to make an error, and you get your extra base there. Versus you know hoping you're going to leg out a bunt. Yeah, that, bunt as yeah. we see, he didn't. You know. Yeah, I think too. It's important to mention in this conversation. He was in the right hand side of the bo- right hand side of the box where he hasn't been his best. Where he hasn't been the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously if he's going against the righty, there's no way he's bunting there. I think we can all agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, I'm, I don't hate it. I understand your point. Um, I don't love bunting. I've been pretty honest about that for a long time now. Um, every time Santiago Espinal puts the bat down, I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> but, um, oh. yeah, I would be all right if he didn't do it again. But in that situation where they're trying to spark a rally, I don't hate it. Um, but I also understand where you're coming from. So let's get to a couple fan viewer mail questions here. We got three of them that we got from the Patreon, which you also can be a member at patreon.com. By the way, you know, as a member at patreon.com, I just found out recently. Stephen Offenbaker. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> All right. So first one comes from Hooper Powell. Should we be happy if we were two games over 500 at the All-Star break? All right. So we're obviously about to go into this May stretch that we're all talking about that we're like, holy crap, like this is going to be frightening. Uh, what do we do? Like they're playing a lot of really good teams. If you get through May with a 500 month, June and July aren't terrible. And it's baseball. You got to play the games. You got to right, obviously. But this is what June looks like to get an idea. Road trip to Colorado, come on for the Cubs, the Guardians, you got the Pirates, you got the Cardinals, you had the Red Sox. July, you've either got the Yankees series, you got the Tigers series, which, by the way, keep an eye on that Saturday Tiger series, news to come. Um, <laughs> and then you got the Rockies and Marlins for quite a few games. I think that if there are only two games above 500, I'll probably be dis disappointed, but I'll still feel really good where they're at because – the central stinks. We've been through this a million times. And I think that what they have post all-star break, the schedule's not terrible. May is just going to be the one thing where it's like, get through this healthy and competitive and you've got a shot. July, two games over 500. That might be a little late for me to feel good about being only two games over yeah. 500. You know, that may schedule you're talking about. Um, they've got, all of their games against the Los Angeles Dodgers in May, all of their games against the Arizona Diamondbacks in May, all of their games against the San Diego Padres are done in May. Uh, basically, they're just playing all of the National League West for the month of May for the most part. Um, and there's some really brutal uh, travel arrangements in there too. They're going to go from Cincinnati to, to Los Angeles um, in back-to-back -back days. Uh, yeah. on the getaway day so like there's there's some stuff like clearly they pissed off a schedule maker somewhere along the way because may mm -hmm. is brutal but if they can be at or above 500 at the end of may even if they're a game or two under 500 at the end of may that's where they should now be able to strike because like you're saying the schedule gets easier and people are coming back tj friedel should be back by then um by the end of june we should have noel v Marte back in the lineup uh, so this team should be in an upswing at that point. So as long as they're above 500, I guess I'll be happy. I mean, I'm not rejoicing at two games over 500 as, as long as they don't have a losing record by then, then, then this whole, you know, keeping hope alive for a playoff run remains. So no, I, I guess I answered that both ways. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'll be happy. And <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want it to only be two games. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. No. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, I, I would be happy, but like, I would be happy, but it would be like it's a it's a weird happy. You know, like like you you expect more, but you understand. Like I kind of understand where Steven's coming from. Like like I would definitely love for them to be more than two games over over five hundred, but um, you know, I I don't know. That, that that's just kind of a weird spot. The end of July is a really weird spot to be only two over five hundred. You know what I mean? So um I, I would i be happy yeah because they're not i don't have a losing record but i'd also am expecting more i guess so it, it's it'll be difficult if they're only like two to four games above 500 the trade deadline they're still in the race yes which, which means yep. make a move this time around mm -hmm. that's all i'm gonna say we're not gonna get into should they or shouldn't they have last year that's all i'm gonna say all right uh question two comes from brandon kamek which i can't believe i still read his comments here after he criticized ghostbusters for not being a good movie but we'll let that slide uh, he said what are your expectations for frito coming back close to who he was last year or like the stone temple pilots or lyric half the man he used to be this is a great question because <laughs> that's a good question um i knew that tj frito was really good last year mm -hmm. then i looked at the numbers and realized just how good he was and Everyone always brings up the fact he's going to his fourth year at age 29. I don't think that's as abnormal as it used to be in Major League Baseball. Actually, it might change because Paul Skeens is like 14 years old. And he's about to make his debut for the Pirates in the near future. Um, but I I think it's probably going to take him a couple weeks to get things going, like like most people when they come back from break, right? And I'm really excited to see how he looks in the rehabs in Louisville. It look, uh, from what I understand, he's starting to swing this week. Uh, he just said on Jim Day's pod the other day, who was it? Tyler Stevenson prank called him from the pod. He said he took 60 swings off a tee that day. So that's a reassuring thing. 
I think by June, if he's back middle end of May, I think by the middle of June, we're going to start to see the old TJ Friedel. Well, the question is, who is the old TJ Friedel? Is the old TJ Friedel the guy that we got last year, or was that an outlier? Was that one of those seasons that, to not be replicated? Um, Jeff and I went back and forth about this all offseason because I really felt like they needed to go get an outfielder in the offseason because I'm not sold that who TJ Friedel was last year is who TJ Friedel really is. Um, I want to be so wrong about that. I want mm -hmm. the guy that he was last year to be the guy that comes walking through that door when they activate him and put him on this team. Cause really they've painted themselves into a quarter where they don't have any other option. They need him to be that guy or they're in trouble. So, uh, you know, I, Half the man he used to be, I don't think – I think that's probably extreme, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> using, my own bit using my own <laughs> bit against me. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I just I, – I want him I want him to be good. I really do. I, I just – I don't know that the super success against left-handers and the everyday center fielder if that's him, uh, we're going to find out real quick because that's exactly how they're going to use it. So it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I always just always have, it's always concerning to me when, a, when someone starts the season laid off of an injury, um, you know, that's kind of the biggest thing for me it is uh, how fast he's able to get himself up to speed. Because, you know, you can take all the at-bats you want in Louisville. You can take all the at-bats you want um, in practice and batting practice and swings off the tee and all these different things. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it, it's a <laughs> – that's funny. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that the biggest thing for him is – for me to see him is um, how comfortable he can get himself – and how normal he can be coming off the injury starting, you know, he got hurt in spring training, you know, he's coming out late on um, how, how fast he can get adapted back to major league baseball. Um, you know, and we've seen that before, you know, we always discussed Tyler Stevenson and his shoulder um, and, and how long it's really taken him, how truly long it's taken him to kind of get somewhat to where back to where he is. So um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how he adjusts and how truly how fast he can truly get back to himself. And Steven, you bring up a great point. Like is, is the guy we saw last year, the guy, I mean, that's, that's a huge question. Here's what I do know. The defense at least gets better immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything oh, yeah. offensively. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. well, no, well, and, and it's, and it's addition by subtraction because for the love of God, we can stop running Stuart Fairchild out there. Yeah. So that just in and of itself, fixes some yep. things offensively. <laughs> I don't know if you watch his at-bats over the weekend, and I get I get accused of putting a lot of extra hate on Stu, and it's not extra hate. Me I'm just, too. Just being, I, I just try and be realistic. He's a 4A player uh, that has occasional moments. That's who he is. Yeah. And some of his at-bats he was clearly overmatched in over the weekend. I mean, he was just – you know, way out in front of things. His whole upper body was looking down the left field line on swings. He was out of balance. He's pressing and it Friedel can't get back here quick enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Truth to that. All right. And our last one we got from good friend, Kevin Lynch. Not sure if you want to tackle this one, this one, but I was asking myself this morning, how this team is, was three games over 500 with the injuries and struggles from key players. I think the record will be worse. Being an optimist, maybe this means this team could take off from Angie. And we kind of answered this a little bit, and I think we are kind of in the yes department on that. So I, I believe this team is going to gonna put a run together. I really do, mm -hmm. especially once we get everybody back. Yeah. All right. Just don't let don't let the month of May dishearten you. I think right. You know, it, it could it could be series wins in May could be very few and far between. Um, <laughs> they just have to not get swept by everybody. If, <laughs> if they can do that, then we'll be okay, I think. Um, but May could be rough. Yeah. Yeah. If they like you say, like you've been saying on Locked On Reds, which you can check out every day on your podcast app of choice. <laughs> if you finish 500 in May, you feel really good about your month of May. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So let's get to some not fun stuff here before we get to some more fun stuff to end the show. Um, and we've all talked about it a little bit. 
Uh, the struggles of Drymer Candelario, which is going to lead into the struggles of other guys getting a lot of at-bats for this team. Steve mentioned one in the last segment already. Um, look, Ofer is last 19, a 580 OPS, two homers, only four ribeye stakes, 34 strikeouts to 10 walks. That is where I'm the most concerned. A 263 on base percentage, 317 slugging, 0 for 4 today with four strikeouts. I think the one thing that we don't point out in this 0 for 4 for four strikeouts because I ran out of room, it was not a competitive 0 for 4 for four strikeouts. It wasn't like he was working a full count and they, they tricked him on the last strike. Whew. In fact, Scott, on the weekend, he was 0 for, 7, 0 for 8 with seven strikeouts. On 0 the for, yeah. Scott asks, is he the new Moose or Myers? I hope not, but I do kind of get a little anxiety because of this. And Ben and I talked about it last a couple weeks ago when all these guys were kind of like, are you worried about CES? Are you worried about this, this, this? And I, look, we all love Spencer Steer. He struggled quite a bit. I was never worried about Spencer Steer. I knew he's, I know he's going to be fine. Yeah. But this is not only eye-opening, it's extremely concerning because – um, one, we're not even going to mention the fact that Nick Senzel all of a sudden learned how to play baseball, like in Washington. Two, um, this is crazy. It just like looks lost no matter what side of the play he's hitting from. Um, and he's your hot corner guy right now because Noel B. Marte and all the injuries. Mm -hmm. But I certainly think he'll be better, but I don't know what that means at this point. So this Candelario conversation is actually my whole second segment on tomorrow's show. So I'm not going to dig real deep on it. Yeah, um, don't so bury the tune lead. Into, tune into tomorrow's show to hear mm -hmm. my Jamer Candelario thoughts. Um, but I do want to say that he's clearly struggling. And I have an issue. I have take exception with David Bell running him out there in the ninth inning for that final at bat. Um, if they were telling us the truth and both CES and Tyler Stevenson – we're good to go after being hit the previous day in the hand while they were batting. If that was true, I don't see why you don't pinch it with CES mm -hmm. in the ninth inning there when Candelario clearly didn't have it. And I, what do you get after a golden sombrero? Do you get like a diamond jubilee sombrero? <laughs> or what? I don't know. I don't know what you get, but he struck out in seven of eight at bats. He clearly doesn't have it right now. Now, yeah. We used to call it the not, rusty bucket. <laughs> whether or not we're thinking he should, they should be done with him, whether or not we're concerned, none of those things matter. In the game, in that moment, someone needed, you know, Freddie Benavides needed to wake up David Bell, nudge him, shake him awake, and tell him we really ought to pinch hit right here. Uh, that's why we have a bench coach, because clearly it's too much for David Bell to manage it all during the course of a game. So mm -hmm. someone should have brought him a binder – and showed him what was going on because yeah. it's criminal that they had an opportunity to win the game. Yep. And why you run Candelario up there. Who's clearly, clearly struggling when you've got those other two guys on the bench. I just, I don't see it. No. Yeah. I, I, I you know, it's just, <laughs> um, yeah, dude, I think it's the, I think it's the at bats, the way the at bats look for me. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, like, it's not even. Yeah, it's not even like he's going up there and fouling off pitches and battling and you know hitting hard ground balls or like or you know line outs. You know when Tyler Stevenson was having a little bit of struggle, early, like he was crushing the ball. He was just hitting into people's gloves. Like he had a ninety eight percent barrel rate. It was just going at people. Like he doesn't even look like he is remotely interested. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I think Candelario's exit velocity is about the same as Tim Daniels' sprint speed. So neither one of them are going to get you anywhere very fast. <laughs> right, <laughs> blow a hammy <laughs> on my own show. I guess you got to get me back for the Steve hates Friedel hashtag. Right? <laughs> but yeah, man, like he just looks like he just doesn't even look comfortable. So, uh, Steve, that's a great point. Like. If you've got other guys, especially Tyler Stevenson and CES sitting on your bench and you tell us they're healthy, how do you not run one of those two up there to try to take an at bat and, and you know what I mean, and try to make something happen? So I, I don't know. I, I you, you hope that this is just a phase, but dude, 
baseball is unforgiving. So, I, you know, I, I think it's, you know, you see him struggling now. I, I hope this is not who he is um, because right now we really don't have a reprieve with Noel and Marte still out. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just hope that this isn't really him, uh, especially for what we invested in him um and and what he's giving us in return yeah i, I encourage both you guys to to check out our show tomorrow jeff's got some st stuff that will help ease your heart a little bit as you worry about okay, Jim. Um, okay. all right good that, you know, that makes I listen, you feel better i listen every day bit. you're my dog so you know we, goonies goonies stay together right so <laughs> that's my second Goonies reference today. Reg related. I feel good it about is, that. Dude, if you start doing right. the truffle shuffle on camera, uh, that could be a game changer for your your rating. <laughs> right. Or if you hit a baby, or if you hit a baby root, <laughs> you might get unsigned from your podcast network just as quick as you got signed. Be careful. <laughs> Shut up, Blue Wire. All right. Well, this here is uh, not a site. That people are going to love so please shield your eyes as i as i bring this slide up as well uh these are all guys right now who are getting rough at bats regular at bats with struggles well benson not worried about him i yeah. think he'll be fine i know he's striking out a lot right now we're gonna be i'm okay there bubba thompson a 278 ops nick martini and luke maley both have six tens anything luke maley gives you offensively is a plus so i'm mm. not he's like great out. at bats today he, he, he did great at bats today they were great yeah, yeah, he battles. Stuart Fairchild, Steve talked about it, 483 OPS. CES, a 525 OPS. Santiago Espinal, 513 OPS. Um, not fun, but as as Chad said, guys, believe it or not, Chad made a positive comment on social media recently. It happens sometimes. Chad Dotson, <laughs> Dotson C. Someone hacked that. his account. Someone definitely hacked his account. They did. Um, I was going to say, somebody had to get his account. <laughs> he said, when everyone comes back, the, all bad the players go away. Yeah. We're, that's just true. What, and, and, and just to finish my thought on that, he sent a positive tweet or a good tweet. Um, were all the words spelled right? I mean, he is an author. He has written oh, a book. It can't that confirm. That mean a lot. Spell check is universal. Okay. <laughs> I was just, just checking. Just checking. Okay. No, put that, put that graphic back up. Sure. As I commandeer your show, look at me go. Please. So, so of, of this list, of this list, Bubba Thompson will be off this team as quickly as they can get him off of this team. Right. Nick, mm -hmm. Nick Martini will be probably the next guy to go after that um, because of his handedness. Uh, it probably by Stuart Fairchild a reprieve. Stuart Fairchild is the third guy to go as guys come back. Um, and then I think when... And, and Espinal might find a way to hang on with this team all the way through the return of Matt McClain. But, but as you look at it, I mean, Will Benson, you want to be an everyday guy. You're right. I think he'll be okay, but Thompson will be gone. Martini will be gone. Fairchild will be gone. And Espinal will be gone. All of those guys will be gone as people come back. And, and it is a whole different, whole different show. And yes, the, he is the new Jason Vossler. Although I have refrained from tweeting about him because we all know what happens when I tweet about Jason Vossler. So I'm not going to tweet about Nick Martini. So, but uh, I mean, but you can, you can see the substitutions, right? You can see mm -hmm. where these guys are going to drop off as, as dudes come back. Bubba Thompson will be the first one to go just as soon as TJ Friedel walks into the clubhouse. That, that'll be the same day move. Max. So yeah. Then, then your next guy is Martini, and that just depends on who gets healthy. When is it? Is it? Do you move Martini to make room for uh, Noelvi Marte and keep the extra infielders? I think that's probably the move because we're not playing Martini in the field anyway. So I, I think you can make a move there. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, man, 100. percent So that was enough bad things to talk about. You guys don't come here for the sad stuff. Actually, this next segment's a good one, but I don't know if you guys come here for this either. Um, I wanted to talk about, so last week we talked about a prospect, and this week we're also talking about a prospect. Ben, who are we? What is going on? This isn't... Uh, dude, I don't, what, uh, it's what's like, happening? It's like, we, it's like we we never watch it. It's crazy. Yeah, I thought we don't know these guys. Yeah. Cheers. Um, you start posting pictures of pizza every week, I, I'm going to think Doug <laughs> might... <laughs> that might screw you for trademark infringement or something. That's true. But I wanted to talk about one Hector Rodriguez, who is making quite the name for himself. By the way, this State and Dragons team is beyond Dude, fun. We Listen, we've got to get up there for a game. Yes. Like, they are incredible. 
Yeah, like all these guys that are super good baseball players are on this team. But Hector Rodriguez, who got called up to the Dayton team last year um, after short time with with uh, with Low A Daytona this year, 329, 379, 873 OPS, two homers, 15 ribeye stakes, Dominican Winter League Rookie of the Year. He's only 20 years old. They got him in the Tyler Daquin trade. And if I remember correctly, that trade was more for Luis Acuna. And this was like, you can take him if you want him. I might have that wrong. It might be reversed. But anyway, um, dude, so we've been talking about like just, I know all these guys we just had when they had the number one class or have graduated to the next level. They're all in the big league team or we're waiting for them to come back to the big league team from injury or et cetera. This kid, I think going into today, I didn't see what he did today. A 9% strikeout rate. Like this is, he won't be in Dayton long. Yeah, he's not going to be there long. No, we might, no, we might no. need to go like next week. Yeah, no, those, and there's a there's a tremendous group of players in Dayton right now. I went yeah. to their, uh, I went to their media day uh, when I was back for opening day. I went up and, and got to meet a bunch of the players. We had some interviews with them, and they're smart, talented baseball guys. Man, they like they all know the game. They all know what's up. Uh, they're all super baseball intelligent. Uh, that's the the pitchers and the position players. Rhett Louder was super impressive in just what the time that I got to talk with him. Uh, Cam Collier is another one that is just going to be an absolute beast. Rodriguez about, is blowing yeah. up. I think all of these guys, you know, as we saw with the wave that's in Cincinnati right now, they kind of all bunched up and then started moving together mm-hmm. for a bit there. I think that may be what happens where the, the Dayton roster – First half of the season is the Chattanooga roster. The yeah, second half of the season, yep. Um, and it could very well be that some of these guys make their way to Louisville even before the end of the season, sure. depending. But um, there's just so much talent down there, and I know that I know that we talk about like not uh, giving up on the prospect capital and and why we don't make trades and 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 guys we're protecting. This system is still stacked. There are yeah. still a lot of guys mm-hmm. in the system that are just going to be making noise. Yeah, I just think like the thing I love about him, and I know the power numbers aren't like super sexy by any means, but I absolutely just love the ability to make contact mm-hmm. and the way to get on base and the way to make things happen. Um, I'm a I'm a big fan. I, I like you said, like I might have to make a road trip to Chattanooga to see him play soon. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's the most impressive thing though, Tim, is that that I mean he is. A nine percent strikeout rate, dude, is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at any level of pro at, baseball, at any level of baseball, that's incredible. So, um, I mean, they got some young studs, dude. It's this this team is a lot of fun, uh, and with us only being forty five minutes away from Dayton, we got to get up there and, and see a game. Yeah, actually. and it's a great place to just see a game. I it mean, is. never mind, never mind that they're stacked right now. Just in general. Yeah. Great place to see a game. There's great stuff around the ballpark. It's a good time in Dayton. Yeah, it really is, man. Um, so actually, Carlos asked, yeah, is Chattanooga getting a new stadium? They are. They're in the process of building a new stadium. Um, funny enough, my cousin just got married last year, and his wife got a job in Chattanooga. So they're living down there. They sent me a lookouts hat last year. I had never had one, shockingly, even though it's one of my favorite logos ever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm stoked for that. And uh, one of these days, I've, I've talked about this a million times with Carlos. If he can just ask some of his old buddies from his 2006 Double A Chattanooga Lookout scene to just have a reunion pod here on Late Night Reds, I will just leave and let them talk, and I'll produce the <laughs> show because that team, if you look at that roster, it's the 2010 Reds, basically. Yeah. And Carlos. <laughs> yeah. Speaking. Of our good friend Carlos Guevara. The Reds head out to old St. Diego for a set with the Padres. He's going to be rooting for. Who's he going to be rooting for in that game? So, for those of you who aren't part of the Reds media podcast feeds like the three of us are, this is just a series, right? This is just three games before you come home for the Orioles. Mm -hmm. For us, this is the Guevara Cup, folks. Yes, it is. <laughs> this is the Guevara Cup. <laughs> Someone feed that kid on the right some food, I was going to say, dude. Good yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. A that young kid, 75 pounds, there, boy. soaking wet. Jeez. 
when Carlos and I started working together on the previous rendition of Late Night Reds, I went on eBay and I bought every single one of these cards they had available. I have like a ton of them. So Steve, you want me to send you one? I don't know how much postage to Hawaii, but I'll get one to you. Oh man. So I know you mentioned <laughs> Friar Faithful. <laughs> I figured he would have picked the Reds because he never got a case of whiplash fishing in a red uniform. Oh, oh <laughs> man. Come on. <laughs> you didn't have to say any names, Alfonso Soriano. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I love you. Any of us now. Nope. We're not friends. We all just got <laughs> hey, his Texans came to Cincinnati and beat our Bengals this year. All right. He got one on us. So, you know, um, but I know Carlos, when we were working together, he would always have, uh, he'd always be one to, uh, show some love to both teams. And obviously when his best friend was on the team, which is not there anymore, but Hey, that's not a conversation we're getting into. We're not doing that. We just wish him well and wouldn't suck if he came back to the team and took some at bats from some guys who aren't very good. Um, but we can, here's the week series. Uh, so Monday we got Nick Lodola going against Matt Waldron, the knuckleballer. Um, I look at Matt Waldron's baseball savant page recently, um, and for a knuckleballer, he's not fooling a lot of people. So hopefully that keeps going this week. Uh, Tuesday, we have Nick Martinez against to be announced. It looks like the guy they originally had slotted at that point in the rotation just got sent back to triple a, um, I can't remember Rafael. I think Rafael Suarez might've been his name, not Ranger Suarez who just smoked us on Monday, different guy. Um, and then wins and then what the hell Tim Monday, Tuesday, Sunday, this what? is what happens when you drink while you're making slides. Right. Tell me about it, know. man. I was at him high noon, start kicking in. He's making slides. <laughs> so <laughs> Wednesday, not Sunday. Um, Graham Ashcraft going against Joe Musgrove. So that is the Guevara Cup Series One of 2024. Ooh, um, I, I, I got something for Carlos. Hang on. <laughs> Carlos says he is a TBA. <laughs> We've got to pull this down so we can get a. Since Carlos is. Oh. Oh, there it is. I don't, I'm sure you've heard this on the shows, but you know, Nate's actually moving to Dallas in the next couple I weeks. Do. I was, I, I texted him to see if he was here already. I was going to meet up with him, but he's not here yet. Yeah. I think it's like a couple weeks, but uh, I'm hoping he'll be in town this summer. He said he's going to try to. So um, I want to talk about this Matt Waldron thing because obviously knuckleballers being such a unique circumstance. Mm -hmm. Things with him where, obviously, any dude who throws that and masters that pitch has a shot to beat you. It's just what it is. Mm -hmm. um, he has not been ideal so far this year for what he's supposed to do. Um, his exit velocity is really high. His contact rate is really high. Um, so hopefully that keeps going this week. But it's also something that really scares me because I've seen when R.A. Dickey wasn't R.A. Dickey anymore and still able to throw his knuckleball and get people out. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that that's not the case tomorrow. But counterpoint, if Ellie De La Cruz can get on base every single time, True. he is going to run wild because the number of times that ball squirts <laughs> away oh, when yeah. a knuckleballer is throwing, Ellie's just going to score every time he gets on base. He'll steal that's second, steal third, steal home. That's what yeah. will happen. That's a good point. Oh, man. And then, uh, you know, maybe Alex Blandino is going to be watching some film as he's trying to go on this journey. So... I, I'm really I'm really looking forward to this series because I know this is another team who Padres on a four game losing streak. They haven't been the team for two years, so we all thought they would be uh, yeah. as far as like the people they brought in. So obviously, it's still have a ton of talent. Tatis, you know, obviously is awesome. Um, so many guys to look forward to there. But this is going to be a fun series. I think this is a really good competitive series. And after take, losing two out of three to Texas, I would very much be very happy with obviously taking care of business in St. Diego. Um, Steve, this is actually closer to your regular time of like when you're like up and awake and watching baseball. Whereas for Ben and I, uh, this is in close to like, you got to go to bed for work in the morning time, which I don't love. Uh, we got a 940, a 940 and a 410 on getaway day oh. on Wednesday slash Sunday. Mid afternoon reds is my favorite kind of reds, man. <laughs> I did joke. Um, I did joke that anytime like uh, the Reds have one of these late, like late West Coast games, it's just free publicity for us mm. because they, like everyone's like, "How about those late? How about the late night Reds tonight?" And we're like, 
when people go and search it. Yeah, they find us, baby. They find us. Um, but one more time, like I said, this is not just a normal series, people. Make sure you're tuning in for the Guevara Cup and keeping tabs. And also, Carlos really loves when you interact with him on Twitter. So if you are watching, hey, that's TV, not for the faint of heart, though. That should come with <laughs> that should come with a disclaimer. Like if you're gonna go yep. at Carlos Guevara on Twitter, buckle up. Yeah, you that's, are not. You are not ready for that smoke. You are not. You are not lying. You are not ready for that smoke. Yeah, you better be ready. Oh man, it's almost like I don't get on Twitter much anymore. But what I do, I know I'm gonna be entertained by that. So that's my joy every single time. All right, dudes. Well, hey, we just are a little over an hour today, so we didn't go too far over this week. Uh, Steve, obviously, everyone who knows who, knows who you are in this case, um, I am Ant Man. So, but if we can just for those, if there's some random Reds fan who doesn't know, how can they find Locked On Reds? Oh, we're we're the Locked On Reds podcast. We're on every single audio feed pretty much that's out there and if we're not on one you want us to be on just hit me up on twitter at s often baker um we'll make it happen uh you can also get us on youtube uh if you're watching this it's easy to find just search locked on reds when this is over and hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you get us every time we go live or drop something extra aloha fridays something i always that's- look forward to i'm sitting on my desk on friday i love it so yeah, those are my favorite. Um, those come back in the off season. We got random lives throughout the season, but the the scheduled Aloha Fridays are all off season long every Friday. Perfect. All right, dudes. Well, we're gonna go wrap this up, but obviously I gotta do my my typicals here. Uh, of course, check out everyone here on the on the Riverfront Reds feed, myself and Ben here on Sunday nights slash Mondays if you don't catch it live to check out the podcast feed. On Wednesdays, you've got Seth Shaner with Red Lake Roundtable getting a bunch of really fun guests on there each and every week. A big one coming soon. News to follow. And then, of course, on Thursday, slash Friday, th- uh, recorded on Thursday, let's go live on Fridays. You can check out the Riverfront Red Show with Chad and Nate Dots and their crew. They had me on last week where we did a draft of our all time favorite Reds. And uh, I think if my team played in that league, I'd win three World Series in a row. I smoked <laughs> them very bad. Um, of course, check out Welcome to the Jungle with Joe and Parker wrapping up the Bengals draft. So excited to see their overall review of what they did in there as well. And then Riverfront Gear, we get all of our college sports feed as well. So on behalf of Ben, on behalf of Steve and everyone here at the Riverfront, this is Tim Daniel. Thanks for hanging out. Take it easy, everyone. <laughs>